Chair, thank you very much. I think we're going to hold the whole questions until the end. So if you write questions down, if you have them, you can give them to one of the volunteers. That would be great. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Maya Katz. Dr. Katz is an assistant professor of neurology here at UCSF. She obtained her medical degree and then did residency training in New York and then came to UCSF where she was a fellow with Dr. Ostrom in the surgical movement disorders division. She stayed on after fellowship. She's a member of the faculty, as I say. Her interests include um, investigation of the effects of deep brain stimulation in patients with movement disorders, various sorts. She's also been developing a multidisciplinary clinic to help people with advanced Parkinson's disease and that's a, um, a moment of research study, but which has been a very valuable resource. And she's going to be talking about it. The, the title of our talk is Care of the Patient with Advanced Parkinson's. Hi, thank you, everyone, for coming out today. Thank you, Dr. Anna, for the opportunity to be here. Talking about the care of people who have advanced Parkinson's disease. And I'm going to start out by talking about what is advanced Parkinson's disease. And I'll then talk about some medication considerations as well as non-motor symptoms. I'll speak about wellness and exercise as well as well as goals of care, and then talk about this interdisciplinary supportive care approach. So when we think about Parkinson's disease and what it means to have, uh, when people have advanced Parkinson's, looking at uh, the role of levodopa is helpful. So uh, typically, the blue line that you see is the blood level of levodopa. And then in the uh, white area right here, you can see this is the time spent uh, moving well without troublesome dyskinesias. So over time, this white area, even though the dose of, of levodopa stays the same, starts to get smaller, unfortunately. And when people have Parkinson's for greater than 10 years, this area uh, is, this, uh, this size here, which is significantly smaller than than Parkinson's disease when it was initially um, when uh, when it was initially um, started for an individual. Now there are some therapies which have already been discussed, such as deep brain stimulation, which can widen the area of time spent um, moving well without dyskinesias. And I'm not going to be talking about that. And then also looking at It's going to be easier for me. Okay. So, and then when we look at Parkinson's disease, uh, there was something called the Honinger staging, which was developed about 60 years ago and still remains true. And Parkinson's disease progression has um, about five stages. And again, as was mentioned by speakers prior, everyone takes their own course with Parkinson's. So not everyone will go through these different stages, and people will spend variable numbers of years within the different stages. But overall, when we think about looking at populations and um, everyone who experiences Parkinson's, we can see that there is a general pattern. So in stage one, there's unilateral involvement. Uh, so just one side of the body is affected. And then stage two, both sides of the body are affected. So it might, might have stiffness, slowness, tremor. And stage three is when we start to see some balance issues. And so there might be just some, uh, when you take turns or just some stumbling here and there. In stage four, people need a walker or a cane uh, to keep themselves from falling. And then in stage five, uh, people will need um, another individual to assist them in walking. 
And again, it's quite variable. So, you know, when looking at these different stages, it's important to keep in mind that people will take their own course and will stay in these stages for different times and may never get to some of the more um, advanced stages of the disease due to individual factors or protective factors that we don't understand, maybe nutrition, as Dr. Christine talked about. Um, but overall, this is a way to think about uh, Parkinson's progression. So as Parkinson's progresses, the motor symptoms in terms of moving well without dyskinesias uh, narrows. And also, unfortunately, the non-motor symptom burden increases. And non-motor symptoms are sort of the under-recognized or the unseen part of Parkinson's. Uh, on average, most people with Parkinson's have at least seven non-motor symptoms. And many of these affect quality of life more than the motor symptoms. And they become more apparent as the disease progresses. In terms of medication tips for advanced Parkinson's disease, people might be on dopamine agonists or um, artine, amantadine. As Parkinson's progresses and just as, as people get older, over the age of 70, uh, many will experience the side effects of these particular medications more than the benefit. And the side effects that affect the um, affect thinking, mood, and behavior. And so overall, as Parkinson's progresses, and as people get older, we start to think about reducing the doses of these medications. And this is just important to keep in mind, uh, regardless of what stage of Parkinson's someone is in, these are medications that you really want to always avoid. So we have um, uh, Compazine, Benergan, Reglan, um, Benadryl, or sometimes people are prescribing medicine called Oxybutynin for overactive bladder symptoms. And medications that might reduce delusions, illusions or hallucinations, um, really the only uh, recommended people are placed on quetiapine, clozarel, or pronunciarin, and everything else is really a no-no because the, all of these medications and treatments um, can worsen Parkinson's. And the National Parkinson Foundation actually has a nice kit that includes a list called a hospital kit, and it includes a list of these medications that you can bring with you to other doctors who may not be Parkinson's specialists. And I wanted to talk about um, a treatment that can help stabilize some of the movement problems that people have when they get to stage three, four, and five of Parkinson's, when that window of time where they're moving well uh, reduces. And I wasn't going to talk about deep brain stimulation because that is a treatment that we really think about earlier um, in uh, Parkinson's, more in the um, early to moderate stage at this point. When people um, have advanced Parkinson's, they are still eligible for a treatment that was recently approved in the U.S. called Duopa. And this is an intestinal infusion of levodopa. It's been approved in Europe for over 10 years. And what, Liba, what Duopa does is it can significantly increase on time without dyskinesias. And for um, our patients who are carefully selected to get this treatment, it has been a life-changing therapy for them. The pump is worn throughout the day in a pack and um, it's disconnected during sleep. And so basically what you have is the um, interior pocket here carries the medication, which is infused into the, um, into the stomach directly into the intestine throughout the day. And it's worn through either a special vest or um, they have different ways, the company has developed different ways uh, for people to actually carry it with them. Most people who are on the Duopa infusion are on this alone. They don't take any other Parkinson's medication. So for our patients who are having off and on times, or dyskinesias, or dose failures, um, uh, including those with advanced Parkinson's disease, they can still get benefit from this, and um, they stop thinking about their medications, basically. 
in terms of their movement symptoms. So remember how I showed you this graph and how the, the white area, which is really the area of time that you're moving well without um, dyskinesias or slowness and how it narrows. And this is the blood level of levodopa, kind of what I like to call the roller coaster ride of Parkinson's, kind of off and on and off and on. With duopa, the 16 hours that people have working, the blood levels are um, essentially just even. And so with that, um, people can um, titrate the dose to this very narrow window where they have just enough to keep them moving, but not too much to make them disconnect. So they can make this white area, which is now this very, very narrow time, longer. And I did mention about the motor symptoms being um, uh, less, and less um, significant uh, towards the, you know, when people start to develop advanced Parkinson's, that the non-motor symptoms become um, uh, more significant in terms of how, uh, how they affect quality of life. And so when we think about Parkinson's disease, motor symptoms are really just the tip of the iceberg. And Dr. Edwards talked about how in Parkinson's, the, um, the Lewy bodies that we have, initially we thought it was just affecting the dopamine cells, but actually we know now that it's the Lewy bodies are throughout the entire nervous system. And that's why people develop, as the disease progresses, more significant non-motor symptoms. And so I did want to talk about the specific treatments um, for some of the major uh, non-motor symptoms that people have in Parkinson's. And so, um, you know, for, uh, for those of you who have a movement disorder specialist, uh, they will know these treatments. And so, um, you know, if I mentioned something that you previously weren't aware of, it's something that you could talk to your doctor about. So, orthostatic hypertension, that's when people feel faint when they stand up or they may even faint. So, uh, of course, it's very important to maintain hydration. And that's about six to eight glasses of beverages per day. And I like to tell people to, you know, as long as they, it's cleared by their doctors, their primary care doctors, or if they have a cardiologist, they don't have any specific problems with their kidneys, their livers, or their hearts, most people can take, um, can drink a pretty significant amount of fluid with, um, with salt. And anything that is sugary and salty is more hydrating. So that's why Gatorade is more hydrating than just regular water. So I tell people to have about 50% of their fluid with juices or Gatorade or coconut water, something with that sugary with a lot of electrolytes, um, as well as those with water. And we tell people we're like that. Um, we're the most doctors tell people not to eat salt. We tell people to eat salt if they can, um, and also just change positions slowly. So those are the kind of more conservative measures that can help people. And then there are a number of different medications that we have. And so for almost everyone with um, orthostatic hypertension, with lightheadedness, when they stand up, we can get those symptoms under control. I didn't put on compression stockings, which people sometimes will talk about, just because I have never had a patient who can tolerate them. So, and there may be people laughing who try to put them on, or, um, but I've never had anyone use them consistently. But they do work if you use them. Um, constipation is a very common issue in Parkinson's disease, and so um, kind of my first intervention is making sure people stay hydrated and um, having some prunes or prune juice daily, and that can be very effective. That can be enough for a lot of people. I tell them to avoid fiber supplements. If you have a big um, chunk of psyllium, for example, every day, you're just making a bulk amount that's going to sit in the, in the um, intestine, and you're going to have even more difficulty with constipation. Probiotics, there's a small study that showed that taking probiotics did reduce constipation. And really the two most effective treatments are Miralax and Senna. And taking Miralax and Senna and just going, changing the dose, going up on the dose or going down on the dose as needed, will treat almost everyone with constipation and Parkinson's. Um, and docusate has actually been shown to be um, uh, similar to placebo in its effectiveness. And then there's some other medications. There's actually some uh, newer medications 
um, lumiprostone and amatiza as well that can be given. But for most people, I find that they just haven't been taking Miralax and Senna um, on a regular basis and you can control uh, constipation for almost everyone. And basically, if those don't work, people should really see a gastroenterologist, probably, just to get more um, specific treatment. Overactive bladder symptoms are common and so for men who have Parkinson's disease, it's usually a mixture of their prostate being enlarged and their Parkinson's disease. So I always ask people to just make sure they don't have an enlarged prostate um, before we go down the road of treating them, for men, treating their overactive bladder symptoms from Parkinson's disease. And there are a number of treatments. There's medications, and, um, and which I listed, uh, and we don't, we don't want anyone to be on other medications for, for overactive bladder symptoms because um, they can actually increase the risk of co severe cognitive impairment, even dementia and Parkinson's. So um, uh, it's very important that, that people are, are taking these types of medications, the trospium, the darfinase, and the merbetric. These are compounds that don't cross the blood-brain barrier as readily, and so they don't affect um, memory as much, or even at all. And then there's Botox for the bladder, which does work. Um, and, and I've had a few patients who get that every three months, even every six months, and it can really be effective. And it, it, sometimes it takes a lot of convincing to get people to talk to the urologist about doing that, but everyone who I've convinced to actually get that procedure done has been very happy with it. Um, there's also an implantable device, sacral nerve stimulation, and then external tibial nerve stimulation, um, and those are effective as well. So definitely, if the medications don't work, it's really a good idea to talk to a urologist. Um, there is uh, eyelid opening ataxia, which um, is a condition that can affect people with advanced Parkinson's, where people have trouble opening their eyes, or raising their eyelids. And so a lot of the times, their family members might think that they're asleep, or they're not engaged, but really they just have trouble opening, raising their eyelids. And that is very responsive to Botox. Wanted to talk to you about friend behavior disorder. So um, I just had a patient who was very active in dreaming and uh, fell out of bed and actually bruised his back. And so that, this is a, um, a symptom in Parkinson's where people act out their dreams, and it's very, very important to treat it because it can cause significant injury if it's not treated. So I consider this to be life-sustaining treatment. Melatonin, clonazepam, usually we can get this controlled. Um, if melatonin doesn't work, clonazepam works in almost everyone. There's very few people where we can't get this under control. And sleep is often affected in Parkinson's, and so we do talk about the routine with good sleep hygiene, get the TV out of the bedroom, don't drink a cup of coffee right before sleep, those kinds of things. And there is a higher risk of sleep apnea in people with Parkinson's, and so that is important to get tested for. And then there are just some uh, basic medications that we use for sleep maintenance. Melatonin can be very effective, it's very gentle. And then we use some other medications like mirtazapine or trazodone are my two favorites. They're very, very mild medications that can really help people go to sleep. Okay. And pain is often an underrecognized part of Parkinson's, but we know now that almost 50% of people with Parkinson's, with advanced Parkinson's disease, have pain. And there can be different types of pain. So, um, there is some evidence that dopamine lowers the pain threshold, that things are more painful for people in the off state than in the on state. Um, also, stiffness, slowness can be painful if someone has underlying arthritis, for example. Uh, dystonia can be painful if people have curling of the toes or twisting of the foot, that can be painful. So there are some general uh, treatments. One, we make sure that it's not just an off, an off state. I have people say, when I wear off, I get back pain. When my meds kick in, I don't have back pain. Well, then my job is to make sure that I reduce their off time. 
that that will be the most effective way to help them. Um, we use ibuprofen, Aleve, if someone's having uh, hip pain. We just need to make sure to really treat um, pain very aggressively. And it's one of those non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's that is under-treated. Um, there are some medications like duloxetine or venlafaxine that are great at treating neuropathic pain, like sciatica, or some people with Parkinson's can develop a neuropathy in their feet. And, um, and acupuncture as well. So some, some of those complementary treatments need to be considered. For dystonia, we do use Botox for toe curling or foot turning. Botox is very, very effective for that. And, there, and um, we're going to have a speech therapist um, talk about uh, voice issues and communication issues, so I'll probably just defer to her. And in terms of the swallowing difficulty as well. Um, so I'll go towards, uh, move towards silovia, which is drooling. So, and that happens because in Parkinson's, it advances, people for, um, forget to swallow. So swallowing is automatic, some of the automatic functions are reduced. So saliva will build up. We can get this under control in almost everyone. We use Botox. We use atropine drops, uh, which are swabs inside the mouth. We use a medication called glycopyrrolate. And then there's some uh, psychiatric symptoms as well. So um, fatigue is a major issue in Parkinson's, and um, it's one that uh, I think is, is rather poorly understood, but it does, uh, for some people, it responds to drugs like Ritalin, Provigil. And there is one randomized clinical trial that showed that um, acupuncture was effective at treating fatigue. Um, it was a randomized clinical trial, so they gave real acupuncture to half of the group, and they gave fake sham acupuncture to another half of the group, and both groups did very well. And the sham acupuncture was someone like me who has no idea what they're doing, putting um, toothpicks on someone who's blindfolded. And that worked very well also. And then, in fact, when the blind was broken and people were told, you got significant benefit, but you, you know, have someone putting toothpicks on you, um, they continued to get real acupuncture and got great benefit. So, it's something about that works. It may not be the actual positioning of the needles, but something about going there um, and being treated for that symptom is helpful. So, um, and it's important fatigue is a, is a symptom of depression, so we have to just make sure that uh, you know depression is a part of Parkinson's, as Dr. Edwards mentioned. Part, the movie bodies affect the areas of the brain that are producing the chemicals, norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine that allow us as humans to experience joy. And so if we don't have those chemicals in our brain, if we don't have enough of them, um, we're unable, no matter what is going on in our lives, to feel good. And so it really is a part of the disease. And people tell me, well, you know, I, of course I'm going to be depressed. This is really tough. And depression is actually not independently um, a part of getting bad news or getting serious news or having a serious illness. It's, um, in the case of Parkinson's disease, it's a symptom of the disease itself and needs to be aggressively treated. It is a, um, it's a neurotransmitter deficiency, basically. And so fortunately, we have medications that can replenish that deficiency. So I, I really encourage people to get that treated and to not try to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and kind of keep, keep on going, because it's not that kind of depression. And so um, we do have medications. We can get this under control for almost everyone. We can get depression to be better. And so psychotherapy is important. The medications I listed are, are some of the more gentle ones that we like to use. And um, Gratitude therapy, mindfulness, space stress reduction. Now there's a transmagnetic stimulation that can be effective, or ECT can be effective as well. Um, suitable or affect, so I have patients who tell me, you know, for some reason I'll just break out crying twice a day, and it'll be embarrassing. And that's suitable or affect. And so that can actually be treated. We have medications that can treat that and can control that very, very effectively. Apathy is a symptom of advanced Parkinson's that we are 
less um, able to control, less able to help. And that is really more something that um, uh, care partners are affected by than the actual um, person with Parkinson's. And then um, due to the underlying disease and many times the medications that people use for Parkinson's, people can have um, see shadows or feel a presence or have a frank hallucination, or even a, a thought, a delusional thought about something that's not really happening. And so we can control that. We have medications. Um, now we have to come to serum, which is specifically FDA approved for Parkinson's disease psychosis. And so, um, so now we're getting better at being able to help with that also. So that was a review of some of the major non-motor symptoms that affect quality of life. I wanted to talk about, I think is really the most important treatment in Parkinson's disease. And if you're not exercising, you got to start. You have to start. And uh, Parkinson, and some studies have shown that exercise can delay Parkinson's progression, specifically aerobic exercise. I tell my patients you have to sweat twice a week. You have to, you have to do that. And improved balance, walking, cognitive performance, we're going to have a physical therapist talk to us. and so. I think uh, I'll defer to her on that topic. In terms of Parkinson's disease and balance, I talked about the stages of Parkinson's disease, and the main thing that leads through them is the balance issues. So as people progress with Parkinson's, in the advanced stages of Parkinson's, balance becomes the main issue. And the balance does not respond to the DOPA. It will respond to physical therapy, though. And so it's really, really important to work with a physical therapist who knows about Parkinson's. And our physical therapist here will talk about that and the different methods. And um, I have had some people use the balance vest. I don't know if you're going to mention that. So, okay, I'll And um, I do recommend that people have a home safety evaluation where a nurse and a physical and occupational therapist will come to the home and tell, you know, get rid of that carpet, that, you know, get rid of that rug that you're going to trip on and other things that they might help with, and they might just help with just very basic things to, kind of, to reduce the risk of falls. And there are medications. There's a small study using a medication called Dinepazil, which is a memory medicine that showed a reduction in falls by 50% in Parkinson's. Um, there's also a small uh, randomized clinical trial that showed vitamin D supplementation. Um, across the board, regardless of level, these falls. And then, as Dr. Christie mentioned, the B12. So B12 can affect balance, very significantly B12 deficiency, and so that needs to be checked. And physical therapists can help with use of assistive devices. And then in terms of cognitive treatments, um, so sometimes I have, I have someone tell me, um, you know, a care partner tell me that their spouse um, suddenly their memory has gotten much worse, all of a sudden. So that's not Parkinson's disease, because Parkinson's disease is very gradual. So if someone is, wor is a lot worse the next day, that is something else. So, and it's most likely a urinary tract infection or dehydration, so that needs to be checked out. And also the doctor needs to check out the medications. Has there been any medication started that has caused the side effects? So if there's a sudden acute change like that, it's not Parkinson's. Um, but for people who are declining uh, on a progressive, gradual way um, in terms of their memory, uh, we do want to make sure we check these 12 levels. Dr. Christine um, talked about that. And we want to make sure that we're treating depression. Depression is a cause of pseudo-dementia. That means that people with severe depression can appear to be demented because they're so depressed. And that can be treatable. So we need to not miss that. There's also evidence uh, for cognitive leisure activities and people over the age of 60 who do daily crossword puzzles have a lower risk of developing um, all-cause dementia. And um, aerobic exercise, regular aerobic exercise has been shown to improve memory. And then um, we use medications like Aricept. And I do encourage wellness activities, so getting a good, good enough sleep, um, staying busy and being social. I think in Parkinson's, as people advance, um, they can become more isolated. That is really dangerous. You need to fight that. 
and get out and get social and get connected to your community. Um, I do recommend mindfulness practices. There are some really great apps um, and uh, that can just help you um, create some space between, you know, if there's a difficult situation, to um, just have some tools to use to um, have a more calm state of mind. And then gratitude practice. This is a really easy technique where um, at the end of the day, when you brush your teeth, just think about a couple of things that you enjoyed that day. And make them different. Don't say, you know, if you love your granddaughter, it can't be my granddaughter, my granddaughter every day. It can be little different things about her. I like the way she smiled. I like the little story she told. So little different things throughout the day. And this practice has been shown to have a very dramatic effect on people's mood. So I do want to talk about um, the supportive care model, which is the interdisciplinary care that Dr. Um, Emma talked about. And I have a couple of clinical trials that are studying this approach in people with Parkinson's disease. And the idea is that in our current chronic model of care, um, where we basically have the patient, the caregiver, and um, a neurologist out here looking at you know, treating motor and non-motor symptoms and the primary care provider here and then other resources where, you know, basically the caregiver or the patient, if they're able, are kind of finding it themselves. And we know just from studies that there, that um, in, the, in our current care model, there is significant undertreatment of many non-motor symptoms. We don't address or recognize psychosocial, spiritual, or caregiver issues. And um, there's a lack of discussion regarding prognosis and goals of care. So what's an alternative model? Well, we think that it might be the supportive care approach. And so um, this is uh, Dr. Saunders, who developed palliative care in the 1960s. And she talked about uh, addressing the total pain of serious illness. So um, in her definition, total pain is the suffering that encompasses all of a person's physical, psychological, social, spiritual, and practical struggles in the setting of, of serious illness. And so that's the supportive care model. And how do we address that? Well, we create an outpatient interdisciplinary palliative care team that has a physician who is trained in approaching care through the supportive model. We have a nurse, a social worker, and we have a chaplain focusing on all of these areas that are not traditionally addressed in our current model of care. And the outpatient and interdisciplinary palliative care team essentially helps to coordinate and provide that support that um, is otherwise on the shoulders of the patient and caregiver. And so with this model, we hope to provide intensive symptom management, psychosocial support, help people with spiritual well-being, and help them plan and prepare for the future. So when we think about psychosocial issues in Parkinson's disease, particularly advanced Parkinson's, we know that there can be changing roles in a relationship. We know that people can lose autonomy and have economic strain. We know that grief and guilt are very significant. There are significant losses in function and losses in identity. And there can be communication difficulties. And we, we need to address those because these are issues that are not currently being addressed in our care model, and they can really significantly impact the quality of life. And so, um, with that in mind, we do work with a chaplain who tries to help people have spiritual health. And the main question uh, to ask if someone is spiritually healthy is, are you at peace? That's the one question that we ask our patients. Are you at peace? And she um, has created this uh, approach to help people gain a sense of peace, regardless of their situation in the present moment. So to build meaning, to help build connection and self-efficacy. And then we address goals of care. And so I want to read to you a quote from a book called Being Mortal by Dr. Tulkawande. Um, who is a, a surgeon. We've been wrong about what our job is in medicine. We think our job is to ensure health and survival, but really it is larger than that. 
It is to enable well-being. And well-being is about the reasons one wishes to be alive. Those reasons matter not just at the end of life or when ability comes, but all along the way. Whenever serious sickness or injury strikes, the vital questions are the same. What is your understanding of the situation and its potential outcomes? What are your fears and what are your hopes? What are the trade-offs you are willing to make and not willing to make? And what is the course of action that best serves this understanding? And um, we need to know that as physicians and, um, and as someone with Parkinson's, these are things that need to be thought about and addressed. And really, every human being needs to think about these things. So, I really encourage, you know, in our clinic, we encourage all of our patients to think about planning for the future and to have basic documents, um, like a healthcare proxy, an advanced directive, and a pulse. And again, I think everyone should have this. I have one. I made my husband get one. It is very, very important that we understand what is an acceptable quality of life for every person. There's no right or wrong answers, and we just need to know what your wishes are so we can follow those. The American Academy of Neurology agrees with this. It published in last year advanced care planning for patients with Parkinson's as a quality measure. Patients with advanced Parkinson's disease will have an advanced directive, completed or have a designated power of attorney for medical decisions in the last 12 months. So that's one of their quality measures, that everyone with advanced Parkinson's should make that and should review it every year. Care partner support is something that we really, really focus on in our interdisciplinary supporting care model. We know that care partner stress can be significant, can affect health outcomes. Um, people who are care partners feel um, inadequately prepared often for their role. And if you ask a care partner, they'll tell you that they would like time alone with their clinician, but they rarely get it. So if you're a care partner, please ask. Ask your clinician. I need some time alone. Can I get that with you so I can talk about things? And again, from Dr. Saunders, she talks about the role of um, medical care, the role of the medical team in providing the environment. And I just want to let you know that you know, throughout your journey with Parkinson's disease, as it progresses, the medical community, we're here for you to help you address all of the different issues um, that cause uh, symptoms and Parkinson's disease to help you have the best quality of life. She writes, ideally the doctor should remain the center of a team who work together to relieve where they cannot heal, to keep the patient's own struggle within his compass, and to bring hope and consolation. There are many diseases that we cannot heal yet, <laughs> but we can help you have a good quality of life. We do use telemedicine to help uh, if people can't get to the clinic, we, we can uh, make every appointment via telemedicine now. And I want to just direct you to um, a book written by our palliative care doctor in our clinic called Life After the Diagnosis, which was just published. And it talks about living well with serious illness. And I encourage all of you to read it. Thank you so much.